Welcome everyone to our panel discussion on the digital transformation of public administration. The event is organized by the Institute for Internet and the Just Society and will be moderated by Maximilian Richter and myself, Sonny San Giovanni. The recent developments in Ukraine are quite unsettling, especially for anyone working in the domain of democratic governance. We've decided to go forward anyways, as not to cause the disruption of the operations of our organization, as well as the ones in our, of our personal lives, as this will only play into the hands of the aggressor for causing anxiety and destabilization in public opinion, especially consider the field of uh, democracy uh, on, and public administrations. The Institute for Interest and Just Society is a think and do tank committed to a just and democratic digital society. We are pioneering an open platform that connects civic engagement with interdisciplinary research focused on fair AI, inclusive digital governance and human rights law in virtual spheres. We collaborate, deliberate, cultivate synergies. We empower young people who work pluralistically, independently, and of course, pro bono, to find progressive solutions to the most pressing challenges of our digital society. Uh, I will, as you all know, uh, today's topic is the digital transformation of public administration. And I will let uh, our co-host, uh, Maximilian Richter, to introduce the topic and our great um, uh, guests. Yes, uh, thank you, Sonia. Um, so it is um, to, just to introduce the topic before we get to our, our, our speakers tonight um, a bit more. It's it's almost fitting um, that we're hosting this event today because it's been almost two years since at least here in, in Germany, where, where I am Professor Hammer Schmidt and Professor Javal are based, um, that the former German government announced that the COVID-19 pandemic, which we've all uh, so heard so much about in the past few years and probably can't even hear it anymore, um, has declared it an epidemic of, of, of national importance. Um, and as we've all heard a lot of times, COVID-19 has accelerated the digital transformation of the public administration. Um, but it is also reasonable to ask to what extent. Uh, when we look here in the German context, we see that, for example, uh, the first section of the coalition agreement of the new German government uh, was dedicated to digitizing the state and fostering innovation. And given that the topic has such a high priority, that could also be interpreted as how, or it could be an indication of how big the deficits still are. Um, but the point here today is not to look back and to criticize overly, it's also to look ahead and see what prospects there are, also both ob obviously negative, but also positive. Um, and we have, uh, we couldn't have any better guests to do this um, than we have tonight with us. Um, we have uh, Professor Deval, who is an assistant professor for law, science and technology at the Technical University in Munich. Um, he researches the relationship between law and technology and focuses especially on new technologies such as AI um, and the Internet of Things. Um, also, Professor Hammerschmidt, um, who I just mentioned before, he's a professor at the Hertie School um, of government here in Berlin, um, where he's leading the Center for Digital Governments, uh, Governance, and he focuses on public management reform, comparative public administration, and public sector innovation, as well as uh, go governing uh, digitalization. Uh, we also have uh, Luisa Macchiaro, who is who researches at the London School of Economics and Political Science, uh, the responsible use of digital technologies in the public sector and investigates ways to overcome uh, biases in AI to um, achieve justice um, in using data in the public sector. And last but of course not least, Massimo Pellegrino, who is a partner at uh, Intelera Consulting, where he works on projects relating to the digitalization of the public sector. So we have a good panel of both researchers um, and experts on the public sector but also the private sector view on how the on how governments are actually doing. And um, since I've already, or since I'm based in, in Germany and I've talked about the German context, um, I think it's fair to start with a question on German context uh, to Professor Hammerschmidt. Um, I've, I've mentioned that we want to speak on, on what's ahead, um, but that also requires us to understand where we are right now. Um, in Germany, we have um, the, on, the, on, the Online Access Act, um, the Online Zugangsgesetz, as we uh, call it in a nice short German fashion, um, which has proven to be quite difficult to implement over the last couple of years. 
And now we have seen uh, nine German lenders um, publish a joint position demanding a successor to the online access act, the online access act 2.0, so to speak, um, which, which they want to be more efficient and transparency in terms of controlling and financing the digitalization of the public sector. Um, Professor Hammerschmidt, um, could you please provide us just with some background on the Online Access Act and the new proposed Online Access 2.0 and how it could look like and what it would mean uh, for the German public sector? Apologies, that was a lot of questions packed into one. Okay, thanks a lot and a very warm welcome. It's really a great pleasure to be here with you today. Um, I think the question you've just raised, I could answer, I think, for half an hour. Um, we probably will not have that time. Um, it's also, I think, a very specific German thing, but what I wanted to somehow illustrate, maybe use this, this case to illustrate, is the challenges we currently face in, in transforming public administration. And I think that's where my background comes. I'm now in this field of public sector modernization for 25 years. Um, and I've seen so many enthusiasm come and go, so many reform ideas with big promises. And then you really see, I mean, do we really transform? And often the empirical evidence is, is much more. So and that's what I want to bring in. We have to be realistic with our experience. Expectations. We have limited capacity government. The purpose of government and public administration is not to transform, to be innovative, to be digital. They have much more other, it it's provides stability, security. And I think that's something what we should not forget. And this kind of, um, the, the kind of um, project that you've just mentioned is a wonderful example of that. I mean, for me, it's a fascinating object to look at. It, it was, I would describe it as uh, the, the most, ambitious reform project ever launched by German government. It was really the promise. There was a law done in um, 2017, and the promise and that the law was somehow um, um, binding to government to, to make all government services in Germany online within five years. So until the end of year 22. So we are still in, in the implementation phase. And that would mean, I mean, you if you know the complexity of German public administration, three government levels, I mean, it took nearly one year just to see what kind of government services do we have, which you now have to make um, um, online or digital. And this, I mean, I was totally puzzled from the start. I mean, how could you endeavor in such a mission possible project? I mean, we had plans to implement much slower um, and, um, and numbers of online of services over the last 25 years, we have not succeeded. And suddenly, there was a law to implement all services in five years. I mean, nearly impossible. Um, I recently also was in a debate with somebody from local government. She she somehow mentioned it was a big botch, a murks, a big murks. Let me just shortly mention what the challenge was, and I think, and what we really could see if you make a project on digitalization too large, too complex, you will fail. And this is what we exactly saw with this law. I mean, at the moment, if you look honestly, what has been done up till now, how much does the, how much of these services are really available in an online form to the citizens so that they really have better services, honestly, hardly anything. So I think if you would ask the average German citizen on the street, um, what do you see? What kind of benefits do you see? None. And I think that's something what we always have to question ourselves. What is the empirical evidence of this? Let's maybe be a little bit more modest, but then really bring something on the ground and implement it. And I think for this project, it was, for example, you need to integrate all necessary actors. We here in Germany, we have local government, which is key for the citizen. They were not really involved um, in the planning of this project. Total failure. Now the new project, Project somehow that the, the OZG, OZG2, which is now in preparation, wants to somehow build on this experience. Um, we made the project too complex. I mean, you cannot start at the same time with 575 services, which in the background have something like 30,000 30, different procedures. This was just too much. Um, we also see, I mean, if you then have too much on the agenda, you do not really become transformatory. It's at the moment more digitization than digitalization. And it also very much ignored experiences from the last 25 years. It did not look at the capacity issues and, and, and the complexity of German federalism. I and mean, that's what I think we always have to be aware of. The, 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 the understanding of what is doable, manageable in public administration 
at the same time, I like that we have all these visions, what could be doable, but we need to be realistic what is, is achievable. Otherwise, it's only, and that was what it was the last year, a dream world for consultants and IT providers. So much money around you can, you could earn as much as possible, but I mean, we see this in big not many profit. What at the moment I think we really are working on is really how do we involve, that, that's this next years to come, we need solid financing. We need realistic plans. What is doable? We need to real, really bring all actors on an, on an on an equal basis into the system. We need an honest, and I think that's what I'm also missing very often in this government um, um, reform. Um, an honest assessment: what has gone wrong? What what have we learned? This humble government, not the big plans, but really what has worked, what did not work, why has it not worked, an honest assessment, evaluation of the of the last years, a realistic planning, a prioritization, um, and we also have to think about how we really can scale up something, um, cannot touch that now in detail, but I think you cannot centrally plan such such a complex project, you need to bring in more competitive market oriented that element so i think um there's much more to do in this direction we need to focus also on base on the infrastructure thing back-end processes which was not really considered in the old project budgetary issues were not really thought about so all the capacity things hr topics so much more to address and I stop now, but that sh I think it shows you a little bit. It's easy to talk about the wonderful vision of um, um, digitally transforming um, government and making it more digital, but to bring that on the ground, this is really the big thing, what we have to be work on and we have to be decent and realistic. Thank you very much. Um, based on your answer, actually, I would love to ask a question to Massimo Pellegrino, who uh, has worked a lot as a consultant uh, for the public sector. I would actually um, love to hear from you, Massimo, about what has been your experiences actually helping public administration um, setting up digital transformation and especially touching on Professor, Professor Hammersmith on what are the challenges that are, they are facing, uh, they're constantly facing, because on one hand there might be some feasibility issues, but I will also be interested in other challenges such as ethical challenges and um, other, uh, any other um, challenges that they might be facing. So I would love to hear your opinion on this topic. Yeah. So good afternoon, everybody. It's a really pleasure to be here. Um, my experience, especially with the, the Italian government, but I worked also in other countries uh, and also in the, in the States, is that uh, there are plenty of opportunities for the private sector to collaborate uh, with uh, public administrations. Uh, and this uh, is already happening. Uh, first of all, uh, the, the, the first opportunity is about uh, uh, innovation, which is, uh, and I agree completely with the, the professor, uh, which is a fancy word, but on the other hand, uh, it has to be uh, pragmatic. Uh, so, <clears throat> and, and this is the first uh, uh, difficulty. But uh, nevertheless, uh, um, public administrations are starting uh, to looking at uh, uh, how to innovate uh, involving uh, uh, the private sector, especially, but not only with uh, startups uh, and uh, scale ups uh, and uh, um, even the, the, the tech giants, right, that are collaborating with uh, almost uh, any government uh, uh, throughout the world. Um, the issue I see, and this is what uh, is not changing uh, rapidly enough, uh, is the uh, procurement process. Because in most of the countries, uh, uh, procurement uh, from the public sector is very rigid. Whereas, especially for uh, innovating, uh, what we need uh, is a level of uh, flexibility and also, to a certain extent, uh, uh, creativity that is not there yet, right? So uh, in, in some cases, uh, I think, for instance, uh, of the uh, UK experience, uh, the UK government is experimenting uh, with uh, um, procurement mechanisms uh, that are uh, used in the private sector. 
I'm, I'm, I'm thinking about uh, uh, warlands or uh, uh, social bonds uh, or uh, uh, you know different uh, types uh, of contracting uh, uh, startups or uh, tech companies. So the, the, the first area is, uh, is innovation. But on the other end, uh, most of the activities for, uh, that are necessary for digitizing the public administrations are not uh, related to innovation. Uh, most of the things uh, are uh, standard things, right? It is much more like, uh, like uh, a broadband or a big infrastructure project or uh, something related to uh, the, uh, the uh, renewal of uh, uh, applications that were developed with all technologies. For doing that, uh, again, procurement uh, is very important uh, because uh, uh, public sector, the public sector doesn't have uh, development capabilities usually internally, but on the other end, they, they need to govern the overall process and they need to be very uh, uh, strong and specific on some phases uh, of the, the development. But most of the development is outsourced to external companies that are private companies. Uh, in terms of uh, challenges, uh, at least uh, here in Italy, what we are uh, um, experiencing is that the, um, the recovery and the resilience plan is a wonderful opportunity and will be a wonderful op opportunity to digitize uh, our public administration. However, uh, what is really lacking uh, is the sufficient level of uh, competences uh, inside the government uh, to govern uh, the, the whole process. Uh, and in this case, uh, it is a really unbalanced uh, the situation uh, towards the private sector because most of the things uh, are going to be delegated uh, to, the, to private companies, right? Whereas uh, it, 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 there is a strong need uh, to govern, uh, to manage, uh, to put together uh, the, the different uh, plans uh, uh, from, from the, the, the government, right? And the third uh, issue I see is about the lack of a unique strategy and vision. Even uh, our uh, recovery and the resilience plan is very fragmented. A lot of money, frankly speaking, there will be you know, uh, a lot of opportunities to do great things, but on the other end, uh, there are a lot of overlaps and uh, um, at least this is my view, a complete lack of a unique and uh, integrated vision. Uh, you mentioned, Sonia, uh, something about ethical issues. Uh, maybe I can uh, talk about that uh, you know, later on. <clears throat> this is uh, mostly related to artificial intelligence, uh, as you all know. But uh, in principles, uh, uh, the other uh, so-called disruptive technologies uh, are also affected uh, by, by ethical and legal issues. Thank you, Massimo. That was, uh, that was really, really insightful. Um, and I think we, we have talked now a lot, and we have both heard from you and from Professor Hammerschmidt a lot about challenges that government faces. Um, but obviously, government is not doing it for the sake of government. It is also doing it for the sake of citizens, right? And I think that's a discussion that we should turn to for a moment as well. Um, Luisa, how do you think our, our government's doing right now in addressing I think we've lost Maximilian for a second. I can you guys hear me? Just as yeah. a quick yeah. quick, perfect. Um, so I'll continue with what uh, Maximilian was saying. So, uh, Luisa, it would be amazing if you could uh, tell us a little bit more how citizens are engaged in this process in digital transformation. So, 
Equality and fairness are should obviously be the guiding principle, principles behind digitalization. Uh, and we would like to know what what is being what do you think is in, do you think enough is being done by local government agencies to consider the differences in the internet coverage, uh, especially in rural areas and digital literacy in general um, and especially what are they doing when consider what do you think it's important to consider when designing new ways to interact with citizens and uh, considering digital transformation um sure well first of all thank you so much for inviting me it's a <coughs> pleasure to be here um i think you know just to dive into the question i think you know every time that I think about this issue every time I think intersectionality, intersectionality, intersectionality. I think that when we talk about digital connectivity or, you know, in this case, digital divide, um, this is really the main concept that needs to be in our heads. And, and in my opinion, this is one of the weaknesses um, of many projects carried out tackling the issue of digital connectivity by local governments. Um, you know, as the necessity of accessing a digital device for anything from basic services to entertainment to work, you know, it grows stronger over the years. And, and especially since COVID, I feel like the discussions over the digital divide really need to scale up. Um, you know, Africa and Latin America, which are two regions I'm very interested in, um, they have felt this effect particularly strongly. Um, the lack of an institutional generalized connectivity, it's, it's quite blatant and, you know, the numbers speak for themselves. So today, less than 50% of Latin America has access to Internet, you know, um, while only 22% of the African continent is connected. And if we compare it to Europe, where, you know, most of the panelists are from Europe, I'm from Brazil, and I do think it's important to have, you know, Latin Americans also and people from the global south in this discussion. Um, in Europe, 88% of the households have Internet connectivity. So how can we talk about, you know, a, a global strategy or, you know, a generalized strategy that's implemented by different countries when we have such a difference um, in terms of access to internet and connectivity in general. Um, and and in, addition, in addition to that, the intersection between other aspects, such as gender, race, ethnicity, socioeconomic status, um, they also play an important role when categorizing who exactly is connected and who isn't. Um, and, you know, the share of the population who has no access, um, they usually hold certain characteristics and that can't be ignored. So they're mostly women outside of the young age group. They live in rural areas. They're part of the developing world. So the digital divide ends up exacerbating other underlying factors of exclusion. Um, and, and, you know, this is what I'm writing my, my thesis on as well. You know, what's also the role of local governments in that? Um, and in Latin America, for example, the process of digitalization was really strongly influenced by a large period of intensive neoliberal influence. Um, and through what we call um, in internet studies data colonialism, this often led the, the design of public infrastructures that are based on the extractivism of common assets in the interest of a lot of corporate powers and usually under the discourse of improving local communities, but in practice that didn't happen exactly. Um, in Africa, most projects tackling the digital divide, um, they are designed and implemented by big international organizations who do indeed have the power, money, expertise to do so, but at the same time, lack a deeper understanding of the intersectionalities um, influencing, influencing these issues. So I think that would be my take on that, like intersectionality is super needed and we have to really scale that up. Thank you, thank you, Luisa. Um, I think it's uh, it's quite ironic how I was just asking a question about internet access and then dropped off for internet issues, um, but that's besides the question. Um, maybe turning to you now, Professor Javal, um, we've talked a bit about the state, about citizens, but now let's talk a bit, bit about the inter interaction between the two. Um, and especially when, when it comes to, to your focus of, of research, um, artificial intelligence, uh, you know, more, I hope by now more than a buzzword and an external technology that's being used um, and it's coming to good use in the public sector. 
Um, can you tell us a bit about how and, and what governments must do to ensure that that using artificial intelligence and algorithms or algorithmic decision making systems um, are not to the detriment of citizens, um, but are actually uh, there, they are transparent um, and they're implemented in a, in a way that they should be. Um, yes, uh, thank you very much. I think um, to contextualize uh, what I will um, talk about, um, it's um, uh, it's needed to say that uh, I appreciate the arguments uh, made that um, digitization in government is in many respects um, lagging far behind. Yeah, and, um, and we have with digital services, uh, not only in Germany, but, but also in Germany, um, um, uh, rather problems. I was interested to learn that in parts of Africa where there is ex especially mobile connectivity, um, uh, that actually uh, a lot of um, services also already work and, um, and uh, people uh, take that up and use that um, because um, also sometimes because of pressures um, of um, the postal service or the problem to, um, uh, to get into places where you can um, have these services in person. So um, this is, I think, one side of the story, the difficulty um, to digitize um, public administration. But um, if you look deeper into the issue, you will find that public administration in many, um, in many areas moves quite fast and, um, uh, and is uh, in, in some areas really at the top notch of digital technologies. And AI is a good, uh, good example. We uh, talk about this on a very sad day where, um, where we see um, some of, or um, allegedly um, um, regarding cyber war, but also um, drone, um, semi-automated drone warfare, where we can really see these technologies uh, implemented or uh, it's, it's to be assumed, but also in other regards, security, um, the intelligence services, threat detection is a big, uh, big topic. Surveillance is a big topic. And in all these areas, um, and we've witnessed this in, in different countries, uh, indeed, uh, the question is how to implement um, these technologies uh, responsible. Yeah? Um, uh, and governments uh, can do uh, different things. I think um, uh, we've witnessed an ethical debate for many years now. There's more than, I think, 170 ethical frameworks um, floating around um, in, um, um, on the uh, level of the European Union. We had a high level um, commission. So uh, this was important to get um, the discussion going. Several countries have issued um, their strategies, for example, regarding um, artificial intelligence and also um, um, in a way gave out strategic goals which were not only to be the best in AI but also um, uh, regarding responsible um, uses of AI and we are now move, uh, moving into a regulatory debate on the European plane but also in, in several countries and we see um, AI regulation for example in, in Germany um, in, in different, uh, different laws regarding tax administration, regarding automated decision-making um, uh, on and in some, some of the federal uh, entities of, of Germany. And this tells you a little bit about um, the ordinary ways what, uh, what government can do. Um, I think um, what government should also do is to um, assume responsibility in um, uh, what is to be called meta-governance. Because um, if you are able to, um, to show uh, that you can actually implement certain standards, this can have a strong pull on, on players uh, um, uh, around, um, on other players as well. Yeah? So, um, for example, public broadcasters could come up with good solutions for recommender systems, which could be, um, uh, in a way, could influence uh, other actors. And you could think about many examples where uh, at least we could ask government to try to do things right. Um, and uh, they have a, a lot of leeway because, um, um, and this is maybe my last point, a lot of the, um, so it's not governments, or um, I think the stance of innovation is, is somewhat changing um, in, in many um, uh, regards, but it's not, uh, would completely agree with uh, Professor Hammerschmidt, it's not government um, government's um, first, um, uh, in a way, task to, to innovate, but um, through um, uh, research funding, which um, is to a large, large extent um, public, government has uh, some, um, 
some ways to influence innovation. And I think um, this is another way how to, to push, at least in certain regards, for um, responsible uses of emerging technologies. Uh, thank you very much, um, Jafal. I would love to continue on this topic and uh, go back to Massimo Pellegrino, because I, as he has said before, he has worked extensively on AI regulation, specifically for public administration. And I would like to, I would like you to elaborate a bit more on what has been said right now. Uh, especially, I would love to know uh, what would you recommend to public administrations where, when taking into consideration the ethical challenges of AI and their applications. Yeah, um, I think that there is a sort of, um, there is a huge gap between uh, the, uh, the regulation level um, in terms of what uh, the European Union uh, has done so far, especially for artificial intelligence, but more uh, extensively uh, on uh, disruptive or uh, emerging technologies as well, and what can be done uh, technically. So in th there are uh, two dimensions uh, because uh, uh, most of the ethical principles or the principles uh, that are uh, um, uh, indicated by the AI Act, uh, the proposal that uh, went out uh, last year in April and uh, probably, presumably will be approved uh, either this year or next year uh, th there are uh, certain things that uh, need uh, uh, technical solutions, uh, which is a, a sort of a paradox. Uh, so uh, uh, if we talk about uh, fairness and uh, non-discrimination, for instance, uh, what is needed is uh, you know, another algorithm that uh, goes beyond uh, what an algorithm uh, is supposed to do. And uh, again, for uh, transparency or interpretability or explica explicability or uh, robustness. So there, there is a huge research area uh, from a technical perspective that is uh, really at the, uh, at the first stage, right? If we talk about the TRL, we are probably at the level uh, three or four. On the other hand, if the regulation will be uh, adopted, approved first by the European Union and then adopted by the European uh, member states, uh, you know, uh, public administrations and companies uh, will do, will need to do something. But this something uh, for now is unclear. So the main thing is probably, or the, the only thing that can be done now is the governance framework that can be established to be compliant with what the regulation will dictate. But again, governance is more about processes and rules and checks. There will be some supporting tools uh, some uh, uh, um, AI governance platform uh, are emerging uh, as we speak uh, and uh, probably or presumably will be adopted uh, to, uh, uh, to, uh, to uh, implement uh, this, uh, this regulation. In terms of the technical things that uh, can be done, at least for now, I'm pretty skeptical because uh, the definitions uh, included in the regulation are not um, sufficiently clear. Uh, uh, for instance, uh, fairness can be defined uh, in uh, hundreds uh, of ways. It, uh, most, of all, uh, most of them uh, are, uh, of course, uh, context dependent, and uh, it, it will be extremely, extremely difficult to, to, uh, to manage this uh, complexity of applying the same tools and methodologies to different uh, contexts and uh, situations. Uh, uh, the same applies to uh, um, transparency, for instance, or explicability. So I think that over the next uh, five years, probably, there will be a much better situation in terms of technical solutions. But until then, 
um, most everything or, or what uh, public administration will be able to do is mainly governance, AI governance, which is enough, right? The other thing is that uh, most of the member states are pushing back the uh, proposal. I mean, the AI Act, uh, uh, France uh, recently, because uh, this, this is what they were supposed to do uh, with the mandate from the European Commission, <coughs> um, uh, commented and uh, uh, modified, in some cases, uh, pretty significantly, the AI Act proposal because the, 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 uh, the burden of public administrations and uh, companies that is implied by the AI Act is deemed to be, uh, you know, uh, not reasonable. So the, the situation is still evolving and we'll see what will be approved finally. But uh, you know, for now, this is what, uh, in my view, is going to happen. We are working on uh, a project uh, funded by uh, Horizon on uh, the um, ethical uh, framework uh, of this disruptive technologies. It is not just AI, it is robotics, uh, internet of things, uh, uh, virtual reality, blockchain, and, 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 and so on and so forth. And uh, we are, Suppose that, well, we are uh, developing some tools uh, to uh, implement the, the principles uh, that we defined. But, or, you know, there are a lot of uh, uh, code of conduct and principles, and mostly are very much uh, similar to what uh, the European Union and the high level expert group uh, uh, defined two years ago. So at the end of the day, from an ethical perspective, from a philosophical perspective, uh, there is nothing uh, that uh, we can say more than that. Now we have to implement uh, what has been said. Uh, and this is what we, are, we have been trying to do with this project uh, funded by the, uh, the Horizon program. Thank you very much, Massimo. I think it's very interesting. And uh, considering we talked about a lot about the Horizon project and we looked at Europe especially, I would love to move to Luisa and actually ask you about uh, your point of view still on this topic, particularly because the ethical debate around AI uh, and generally human rights in the digital uh, space is most of the time centered on Western countries. What are the specific challenges in the global south and what model of governance should be adopted there in terms of AI and uh, ethical fairness? Well, I think this is a super important question, which I, I hope we, we talked about more. I mean, maybe it's going to happen. Hopefully it's going to happen. Um, well, I think datafication has really appeared to governments um, in the global south, just like in other places, but especially in global south as you know, an innovative solution to some of the most long lasting problems in the regions, you know, such as poverty, safety, justice, etc. But you know, as new technologies, and here we're talking about AI, but you know, it could be any any technology, even the most basic ones. Um, they reach governments as a solution to some of, you know, the regions, these regions' most complex problems. We see a new form of governance, which is algorithmic governance, you know, which we talked about so much. Um, and AI systems, as we have all seen, they are designed to promote efficiency, deliver more accurate results. Um, and they really end up being an aspiration even for governments that are really usually running outdated softwares and they're led by ancient governors often um so but you know there has really been a dangerous tendency in these regions to adopt data-centric systems um and deliver um an algorithmic type of governance that doesn't fully assess the potential risks caused by such practices and you know different from what we're seeing you know rising in the eu there are no big frameworks for that, not a lot of consequences for the misuse of AI. You know, we see a, a growing demand for that, but still it's not as developed. And, you know, as this develops, we see harms being done to harm being done to many people. And, and I think for me, the question that 
the question shouldn't be how will we use AI to solve a problem, um, which is something that I see a lot, but rather what problem are we trying to solve and why and how will we solve it? If AI is the best means to achieve this goal, then great, like it can be applied. Otherwise, it shouldn't be forced. And even if AI is indeed the right tool, which can be in many situations. It also can't be a single touch point for citizens. Um, and I think this applies to you know, the global south, but also to the global north. But in my opinion, and, and that's what my research focuses um, as, on as well, and including there's gonna be a book chapter that I wrote that will be released this fall, um, which is, I think there's a pressing need to apply what I call data justice frameworks. So in other words, frameworks that help assess whether there is fairness in the way that people are made visible, represented, um, and treated as a result of their production of digital data. So, you know, apply these frameworks um, and adapt it to projects that have already been implemented in these regions and future problems, uh, projects that will be um, implemented to analyze the potential risks of these systems, guarantee privacy, non-discrimination, um, and, you know, we really have some sort of governance over this. Um, and, and, you know, my long-term vision, I think it's to ensure that the allure of the data revolution doesn't shield public administrations from developing evidence-based, um, ethically built public policy. So I think this would be kind of my take on that. Thank you. Thank you so much, Luisa. Um, as I just, we, we, we just take a step back now because we've gotten very deep into the discussion of governments and ethics which has been really really interesting um but also obviously there we wouldn't have this discussion if this if the technologies behind them wouldn't exist right so we also have to ask the question where the technologies come from um that the public sector uh, actually uses and uh, professor hammerschmidt maybe over to you again um we see in, in some European countries and also now on the European level, a new push for, for um, a new sector that is called government technology or, or GovTech that tr tries to be more inclusive to also smaller players in the market that have more, sometimes better, oftentimes better, more innovative so solutions. How do you see this playing out on both um, a German on, and a European level? And, and how do you see the importance of, of creating such an innovation ecosystem? I mean, that's definitely one of the direction which I very much support. I mean, um, I will have a meeting next week, Monday, I will be introduced. We now even have in Berlin a GavTech campus. So this is also a hot topic in Germany. We just saw last, um, I think yesterday, there was a call published by the European Commission, an incubator, a GavTech incubator. So I think we are increasingly aware that, and I mean, I think that should be clear. I mean, government alone does not have the capacity. We need to collaborate. I mean, Massimo very much emphasized that we also had last year a server with government officials procurement is the, the crucial trigger to really enable much more in government digitalization. Um, I think, I mean, GovTex can play a, an increasing role, but we also should not overestimate that. I think we have to be realistic. If I just see, I mean, we have some, some students who have established this. These are very small. They can offer certain, I think that the high potential is especially at the local government level, where I see much more potential for GovTex for the big government solutions for a central, I mean, I, I still think there's a, a major role for large GovTech tech providers because, I mean, you just don't have the capacity among these small GovTechs. So I think it will be ecosystems where we need to find the right way or right balance between the big techs, um, the classical providers, the small. I mean, what I also think um, what we have to be a key issue, for example, here in Germany, why we have this complexity, most governments have their own IT providers. So we also have them in the GovTech system. And I think we need to create an ecosystem which also um, gives a central role to the, gov, uh, to the government side. So that uh, the IT providers we have in central government, local governments, and really find a way to balance that. We need to know which uh, the best where are the specific strengths and weaknesses of the different actors and how we can bring them together in the best way and Louisa I very much liked your idea I mean this global south perspective I've just launched a seminar 
last week um, with TIZ on this Global South, and I, I increasingly became aware how blind we are on this kind of topic. I mean, there is no literature, there is no research. We have such an, a very, very Europe or um, uh, modern centered discussion on all this digitalization. And there's so much exciting going on in the Global South, but also I think both the potentials and also the dangers are are much higher in, in both directions. And so I think this would be very interesting for us to learn also from the Global South. South America is a wonderful example. And then also, because in these areas, you can try out much quicker certain things. You don't have this legacy we have in our countries. I think this exchange on an equal EI side would be much more interesting for the future. And also what you what what can happen on GovTex. Let's see what what kind of countries like Africa, South America can do on that and, and have more exchange of that. Thank you very much. I think there is this is a really interesting um, conversation. Um, as the time is running up, I will say that we should definitely uh, switch to our q and I see there, there are a lot of interesting questions. So uh, from Zoom, our first question is, how can it be that the EU Commission, who invented GDPR using the software as a US-based provider to manage its largest innovation program, Horizon, um, unthinkable that the US will do the same on a software platform? Okay, sorry, the, the phrasing of this question is a bit... <laughs> okay, um, so how can it be that the EU Commission um, uh, Thinks that it's unthinkable that the US will do the same on a software platform that is open to foreign secret services. So I guess the question, generally speaking, is um, what are the how can the EU find the balance between the GDPR and the uh, software platforms that has been uh, provided by the US government, which is potentially open to foreign secret services? And whoever want to take that one, uh, I'm happy to let me speak. I think uh, this question uh, points to um, uh, to the context of digital, uh, what's discussed as digital sovereignty and the question which uh, platforms we use. And I think we're observing um, a kind of change of paradigm um, from a globalizationist um, paradigm where actually um, um, countries and, and providers uh, try to integrate and I try to use uh, solutions that uh, were fit best uh, to them. Um, um, and, and then uh, now we're moving on to defining core um, areas of the infrastructure in order to, um, to protect um, things. And I could point to the European CHIPS Act and, and many other developments. Um, uh, but uh, IT security is a, um, um, is a very important concern. I wouldn't say that um, uh, a provider from another country uh, is necessarily um, worse. If you um, follow what happened uh, in, with the US government um, and, and uh, the public administration in the US and the uh, Azure um, uh, um, uh, leaks and, and the problems they had, uh, you see that it really doesn't depend um, uh, all on, uh, on the nationality of the provider. Um, but uh, many products can be also secured, pen tested, uh, and adapted, especially um, for these high profile, um, high profile um, uses. So I'd be um, careful to draw um, um, conclusions too fast. Um, uh, but definitely we see, I think this, this question is in, this, in, the, in the current spirit um, where um, one is, or many people trust uh, more products um, that, that come from their jurisdictions. And uh, there is also con uh, continuous efforts to, um, to, in a way, incite uh, new industries. Um, uh, we could talk about cloud computing, but there, of course, uh, US um, companies are also, uh, and the uh, Gaia-X project where US companies are also part of. Um, so you see it's, it's not a black and white, uh, not a black and white um, uh, thing. Uh, but this is, a, 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 I think, a raising a concern uh, that um, um, uh, that speaks to digital sovereignty. 
Thank you very much, uh, Jafal. I would like to add uh, a little note on this matter. Uh, as I have a background in intelligence and security, um, definitely there is always the issue of um, software and especially intelligence technology being open to foreign secret services. Unfortunately, this is uh, one of the main challenges of security and defense worldwide, in the sense that there is no international law for in regulating intelligence. And we always have to start from the uh, theory that uh, there is always going to be some sort of infiltration, there is always going to be uh, some intelligence. Every country in the world, even the mo most democratic ones, are carrying out intelligence activities. Now, as Professor Jafal pointed out, it's really important to keep in mind that um, this is where the ethical questions arise, and this is when um, institutions, whether that may be the EU or local um, institutions and governments, really need to think about, um, they really need to put an effort in considering who are the people that are more reliable, what type of technology are we using, and how intrusive and abusive uh, is, is this. And especially when considering backdoors, obviously there is always uh, also a technological point of view in how we should really focus on making sure that uh, there is the best level of security possible. Uh, with that said, unfortunately, uh, that is the dilemma of security. There is never enough security anytime. So there's always something better that can be done. But uh, without taking this conversation a whole different um, direction, we have another question from our Q&A session. Uh, and it's uh, about um, uh, youth and technology. So um, one of our uh, listeners asks, says, uh, thank you very much for this very insightful panel. As a young listener, I was wondering if you could give a if you could dive a little more into the role of youth in digital governance. I think this would be a fantastic uh, topic for uh, especially for Luisa and Massimo Pellegrino, who might have very different perspective on these topics. Um, well, I guess I can I can start answering. I think we often talk about you know making young people's voices heard. But also, I think it's important to ask ourselves, what's our role as young people to speak up? So when public administrations, um, when they design interventions and, and assess their effects on society as a whole, I think young people really have a crucial power, you know, to bridge the gap between the analog and the modern. And that's not because of our age, <laughs> but because we also have the tools and the knowledge to do so. Um, I, I often see projects that include the youth in digital transformation and they're usually advertised you know as um the youth building si building systems for the youth um and not the youth building systems for everyone <laughs> which i think it's you know it's an interesting perspective to have because so uh, now i'm a fellow um i'm a youth fellow at the european dialogue uh, on internet governance um the Eurodig and last year we have built you know powerful mission statements directed to European governments that tackle not just the inclusion of young people in digital transformation. Um, it, they also address disinformation, digital self determination, literacy, digital government, data privacy, platformization. It goes beyond. So it really you know it goes beyond of what I usually see in the discourses made by public bodies. So yeah, I don't know just. To sum it up, I think for me, what's striking is that it's not just about inclusion, um, because you know that kind of feels like it takes the power away from us. I think it's about embracing meaningful, meaningful leadership. So I think that would be my take on that. Yeah, we we um, we have been using a lot of uh, young people uh, for uh, design thinking, for instance, or uh, user experience design which is a topic that is uh, becoming uh, increasingly important uh, for, uh, for governments. So <clears throat> in, uh, as Luisa said, uh, um, the view that uh, the youngest uh, uh, can bring uh, to public administrations uh, is really important. And what we are trying to do is to uh, uh, combine uh, different perspectives, right? So we are very, um, uh, sensitive uh, to uh, to uh, diversity in, in in any sense, right? But in that case, uh, especially for designing uh, new apps, uh, new uh, systems, uh, uh, even new products, uh, in certain cases, uh, uh, design design thinking as the the uh, the main methodology 
uh, but that is that can be very complex and very deep uh, and also very uh, uh, multi multidisciplinary you know the role uh, in consultancy so in uh, companies like uh, <clears throat> the company uh, for which I work for, but also in governments that can be very important because redesigning or designing what citizens will be experiencing in the future is a key element, irrespectively of the technologies that are being used, right? So, this view, this fresh view in many cases is very important from a cultural perspective and also in terms of usability, in terms of how things will be used by any kind of people for, for, for public services. Thank you. Thank you both to Massimo and Luisa. Um, with, with the time in, in mind, uh, we would have last questions for, for all of you. Um, and we would appreciate if you could keep your answer as short as possible, because it's one of these questions that you could go on and on and on about. Um, it's a question that is, um, you know, it, it shows your pri priorities on, on, on digitalization. It's basically, if, if you were to be the next um, digital minister, um, the next digital com commissioner for, for the digital, whatever role you want to assume, um, what would be your number one priority in uh, pushing digital transformation of public administration? Maybe uh, let's start with uh, Massimo Pellegrino first. <clears throat> Very tough question, actually. Um, uh, probably <clears throat> um, uh, what I have uh, just mentioned, uh, the uh, redesign of the main applications. Uh, I wouldn't go for, uh, you know, innovation uh, uh, of, uh, you know, very fancy things. I would go for uh, the, the, the basics, the basics. Uh, the redesign of the main and core applications uh, for governments. Thank you. Um, over to you, Professor Chival. Mm. So I'd go um, for the opposite. Uh, what I would try to do is to put um, new people in innovation seats uh, to see um, what people um, really, uh, really want and to have them have a say, but also um, have more um, uh, participate deeper in, um, in this shaping of, um, of technologies. Um, I think this that speaks to um, to what we said about the global south. That speaks to what we said about uh, about youth. I would like to know uh, not only uh, have them participate as um, as as users, but as innovators. Um, that speaks to vulnerable communities, but also to um, to uh, the population. And I would try to uh, to get a new drive um, by by creating ideas that really matter to the people and that. Uh, maybe reframe um, technologies in the sense that um, civic um, civic tech and uh, public interest tech uh, comes into uh, comes into technology. So just to um, uh, to shake up, um, of course, I think um, uh, what uh, Massimo Pellegrino said is, is all important and would be the wise thing to do. But uh, I would try to uh, try to shake up things a little bit by by putting people into innovation seats. Okay, that's uh, that's a good point. A good uh, slogan: "Shake up things." Um, maybe, yeah, Luisa. Um, I think for me, I would echo. You know, I think what Christian said, and I think also, again, touching on my point about data justice. I feel you know when we're talking about technology and AI and and uh, you know different types of innovation, data is what drives it all. So I think it's really important that we have data justice. So, you know, you know, a fairness in whatever that means, you know, in the way that, you know, people are made visible, represented and treated as a result of, of their data. So for me, that's one thing, data justice, because I think that influences 
um, a lot of other things, but of course also having different people leading um, digital government or, and just digital pro projects in general that influences a lot as well. So that would be my. So we've heard about the basics, the radical data justice. Professor Amersmith, what, what would you do in your first day in office? <laughs> I think we always have to be realistic. I think one thing for me is to prioritize on the, in the air, um, digitalization on the areas where we can create best benefit, impact, public value. So not to, to try to do everything at the same time, but really, and then also measure evidence-based. Do we really um, keep to our promises? Uh, do we see what we promise? So what are the benefits? A little bit also questioning ourselves with all these agendas. Does it make sense? Do we deliver on what we promise? A, a realistic evidence-based stance to it. And the third, what I always try to push, I mean, it's people management. Digital, don't make it in the hands of digital experts. No, it needs to be digitalization. It has to affect everybody. It's a cross-cutting issue. Make it HR. I mean, how do we, what people do we select? How do we train them? How do we develop them? Digitalization has to be everywhere and it has to be a, a people and HR topic and I think that's if you don't if you miss this side and keep it in the hands of the digital IT experts we will not make progress it needs to be really a cross-cutting issue and with people management we, we need to do that thank you very much I think uh, all of your answers of the this quick round actually really summarized really well as well most of the points that we uh, brushed upon throughout our panel discussion from uh, the basics of what should be um, the priorities and the basis to actually foster innovation um, in the public administration uh, to AI and ethics and how to bring actually the youth at the center of this. Uh, I really think that we managed to cover many issues and many topics that really deserve attention right now. Um, as I would like to thank all of the speakers, uh, it has been an incredible pleasure to have you all. Uh, and especially going forward, if anyone working for the public administration would be interested in knowing more about ethics, uh, youth participation, I think that the Institute for Internet and Justice Society is the best place where to reach us. So thank you very much, everybody. And thank you so much for your time. So have a good evening. Thank you. Bye. Thanks a lot. Thanks a lot. Bye. Thank, thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. 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 bye.